an AP macro FRQ. Let's do it. Assume that the economy is in long run equilibrium. Assume that consumers wish to hold less money because they use credit cards more frequently to purchase goods and services than cash. So first of all, let's just draw. We know our aggregate demand and aggregate supply curve. Make sure you understand it. It's not necessary for this question, but I'm drawing it anyway. In equilibrium, this is equilibrium or long run equilibrium or potential GDP or full employment or your natural rate of unemployment. It's all those things. So we are in equilibrium. We don't really need that. Uh, they do ask us, though, to draw a correctly labeled graph of the money market and show the effects of the reduced holdings of money. People want to hold less money. What does that do? Now, I tend to be tutoring people, and they tend to be able to draw the money market. You have to know how to draw the money market graph, obviously. Money supply is vertical because the Fed controls all of the money supply. Uh, demand for money is downward sloping price oops not price level come on charles how about uh, nominal interest rates are on the vertical quantity of money on the horizontal so tends to be that the first thing when people read this uh, and they think of the money market they're always thinking of money supply but nowhere have we talked about there being any buying or selling bonds there's no open market operations nobody has said anything about the rrr going down um, nobody has talked about the discount rate. All of those things would affect the money supply, but none of that has changed. The only thing to change is people want to hold less money. Now, your demand for money is the, I just think of it as the amount of money that people want in their pockets. That is what the demand for money is. The amount of money if they want to hold in their pockets. If they want to hold less money, your demand for money decreases. Now, there's really two things, and I want to just cover this. There's two things that demand for money um, is affected by. It tends to be just this sort of understanding of how much money do I want to hold, less money or more money. But then there's also the idea of the price level and how that affects demand for money. Let's say I take you to taco lunch, and I'm a cheap guy, so I'm only going to take you to a taco lunch where it's $10. We both eat a full taco lunch for $10. What is my demand for money? What, how much money do I need in my pocket to take you to taco lunch? Obviously, it's 10 bucks. That is my demand for money. But what if next week I take you to taco lunch and it's $20 now for both of us to eat? What just happened to my demand for money? It just increased. Now I need $20 in my pocket to pay for taco lunch. So recognize that when the price level goes up, demand for money goes up also. You're going to see this in other places and you're going to need to know that. So um, obviously in this situation when the demand, not in this situation, the tacos, let's get rid of that. I just wanted to throw that at you. So you it tends not to be talked about as much. We always talk about what shifts the money supply, but we don't tend to talk or go over. Um, there's only about three FRQs that are specifically about demand for money shifting. So we don't get tested enough on it to sort of put it in our brain um, as well as we should. Anyway, as the demand for money decreases, nominal interest rates go down. Interest rates would decrease. Um, good enough. Understand also, do we need to answer it up here? They do say show, make sure you as arrows show what's going on. Yeah, I think we're good. B, based on the change in the interest rate of part A, what will happen to the following in the short run? Prices of previously issued bonds. Just know, I don't think they've ever asked us to explain it anyway. Know that interest rates and bond prices go in opposite directions. Never have they asked us to explain it, and I'm not going to explain it here. Um, because it is a hard concept to get across. But interest rates go down, bond prices have to go up. The price level in real income. Now, the real income part, I have a very hard time with this question um, because I find it to be somewhat um, not clear. So I'm going to ask you to, if you want to know here how they're answering, I'm not going to put, I'm not going to talk about that in this lesson. Um, if you want to find it, just go to the College Board questions, and they will talk about what this question did to real income. I find it 
inconsistent with the way they've talked about real income in the past. So I'm not going to go into it. Uh, the price level. Obviously, we know if demand for money goes down, right? And that means nominal interest rates go down. If nominal interest rates go down, investment goes up. Aggregate demand would therefore go up and the price level would go up. And that's exactly what we're talking about. Now, I guess I should just mention it. They're talking about real incomes here. I think they, that a better word would have been um, total incomes or aggregate incomes uh, instead of real. What I tend to always put into my brain is when the price level goes up, real numbers, whether real GDP, real interest rates, real wages, uh, all go down. In this situation, I think the understanding was that aggregate demand would shift to the right we would have higher or more incomes. Remember the Y stands for incomes. We would have more people making total incomes uh, in society. Real incomes though, it gets tricky about. I don't like how they did it, so I'm not gonna go any farther than that. Uh, all right, C, with a constant money supply based on your answer to part B, I, I, will the velocity of money increase, decrease, or remain the same, or is the change indeterminate? Do find a cheat sheet um, on my blog or send me an email for it on the velocity of money. It's a very small part of our course. Uh, you're going to have probably no more than one multiple choice question, and you'd be lucky if you ever see it on an FRQ. But it is something we have to know. So um, just understand that the theory of exchange is the formula M times V equals P times Q. Uh, both of these, this is an identity. Both sides have to equal each other. This is nominal GDP on this side. This is nominal GDP on this side. This stands for the prices or price level. This stands for what we would consider probably real GDP or output. This is the velocity of money, which is the amount of times a dollar would travel around. I don't have to know that too much. Money supply here. Obviously, this is just money supply or the amount of money in society. So they're saying there's a constant money supply. Money supply can't change. Uh, based on your answer to B2, we already said the price level's going up. So if the price level goes up on this side, the only thing that can happen is this side velocity has to increase. So make sure you understand that. There are, n there's probably about five or six uh, multiple choice questions on this. Once you do those five or six, um, you'll get a good idea of how they can test and play with these um, variables. Anyway, um, maybe I'll do a video about that. All right, let's look at D. If the central bank wishes, uh, so that was just velocity would t -t -t increase. If the central bank wishes to reverse the change in the interest rate, identified in part A, what open market operation? So open market operations, again, is either buying or selling bonds. We know buying bonds is expansionary. We better know. It means the money supply would go up and nominal interest rates would go down. Obviously, selling is contractionary. Money supply would go down. Nominal interest rates would go up. Remember now, the thing here, we when the demand for money went down, interest rates went down, we want to get them to go back up. We're going to want to have the open market operation of selling bonds. All right, guys, I hope that is clear. Uh, cheers. Thanks.